Welcome to the Uncut Podcast. I'm Pastor Luke. And I'm Pastor Cameron. And this is the Uncut Podcast, where we have honest, uncut conversations about faith, life, and ministry. Today, as we're recording this episode, and potentially, if you're if we get this uploaded later today, uh, it's the eclipse. Eclipse day. Eclipse day. So it's probably too late for us to give you a PSA warning about not staring into the sun, but... Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, also, don't be pagan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't do anything weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about... This is solely not what we're going to talk about, but I was thinking about, like, this morning, it's like... What would it have been like to have been like a medieval peasant and like just randomly one day the sun gets covered over and you're like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> it would be interesting. <laughs> it would be interesting. Yeah. Who knows? <clears throat> I'm sure it happened. Oh, I it did. It did. It definitely did. I'm so, sure there's historical records about the first eclipse that was documented and, you know, but I'm sure like the classicals, like the Roman and Greeks knew about them and had them charted and stuff to yeah. a certain degree. Because they had the moon phases charted, so like lunar calendars and stuff like that. But during medieval time when, mm. you know, all that knowledge was really lost to the mass majority of Western civilization, mm-hmm. like... You know, medieval West was weird. Mm -hmm. Like, the plague. Mm -hmm. Like, people thought, like, the world was ending with COVID. Like, Mm -hmm. COVID didn't even get close to touching how many people died of the bubonic Bubonic plague. plague, yeah. Um, Or the Spanish flu. Or or the Spanish flu. Um, Like, yeah, there have been some cataclysmic events on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Um, So. Largely lost on us in the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, anyways, we're not here to talk about the bubonic plague and or the eclipse, really. Or the eclipse, really. We're going to talk about liturgy. Everyone's favorite topic. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't even know what that is. I mean, liturgy would be, I would say, to like just make it a little bit, maybe to draw a caricature of it. Liturgy is what you experience when you go to the Catholic Church. There you go. Or the Episcopal Church. Yeah. Or really any church that has, I wouldn't, and there's going to be a caveat later on about this, right? Or any church that is considered like high church. Yes. Episcopal, Lutheran, even some more traditional United Methodist churches have they have a pretty significant liturgy, Presbyterianism. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a lot of mainline denominations. Yeah. And liturgy is what you would basically experience as the order of service mm-hmm. on a Sunday morning or for a, for a church service. And it would look pretty much the same every week in terms of the elements that yeah. you went through. So there would right. be like a call to worship mm-hmm. and a pastoral prayer and a call and response yep. and a scripture reading and a song, and then another scripture reading, maybe another song. Maybe and then, a creed. Yeah, a creed recited, um, a message. Um, if you're in a, you know, if it's a communion Sunday, mm-hmm. then there's kind of like a whole separate communion liturgy that's built into the liturgy of yep. the main um, service, mm-hmm. and you go through that. And... Um, and it's been a way throughout history to bring order mm-hmm. to the worship, to maintain its orderliness, yep. and um, to help. Um, I think one of the things that is distinctive about liturgy, <clears throat> at least in my experience or understanding, is that liturgy represents a a tie to um, historical worship yeah, and communal worship where it's not just one guy's design of how we're going to Mm -hmm. exist on a Sunday morning together as a community, but that it um, envelopes and and encompasses the entire community Yeah, where there's maybe a call and response and a call and response and a call and response or a, 
mutuality of prayer and confession mm-hmm. and response to the word. So yeah. um, we, if you walked into conduit mm-hmm. um, and you asked the random person, is this a liturgical church? What do you think that they would say? Oh, they would say no. They would say no. Right. right. Um, but if you ask one of us, is this a liturgical church? What would we say? Yeah. Yeah, we would say yes. Right. Uh, why? Because every church has a liturgy, Cameron. Yeah, every church has a liturgy. But what do you mean by that? Like, like the way you kind of just defined <clears throat> a liturgy, right? It's it's the thing, it's, it's like at its... At a re- very reductionist, so let, let's just talk about it from like a practical standpoint for a moment uh, before we go to like super, we, before we talk about its theological components. But like from a practical component, it's what happens when and how in the service. Mm-hmm. It's like the order of service. Mm-hmm. Um, and in each element kind of is essential to its part, plays a role, and that element is generally looks somewhat the same week to week. Mm-hmm. And so your service or the church, like one of the reasons why like people would come into our church and say, oh, well, this isn't a liturgical church is because of the way our service kind of looks, right? Mm-hmm. We maybe have somebody who's like, hey, everybody, we're going to start worship, you know, it's a good day to praise the Lord. Call to worship right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we start out with uh, a song, usually of higher tempo, mm-hmm. um, into a more slightly more reflective mm-hmm. song. And then we exit out of that through prayer that's extemporaneous, led by somebody who's giving them announcements. Mm-hmm. Um, sign up for this thing. This is happening. Talk about the vision of the church and what we're all about. And then prayer into the sermon, mm-hmm. sermon, and then prayer out, out of, of the, the sermon. sermon. Lots of prayer, uh, mostly extemporaneous from somebody on stage, mm-hmm. and then um, and then the worship team comes up. They do three to four songs, um, starting in a more contemplative and reflective space, moving slightly more energy and praiseworthy towards the end. And then we, you or I, come up, whoever was preaching that week, at the end of the last song, and we kind of say a benediction, which is either a form of, again, an extemporaneous prayer or a passage that we preached on or something that relates to the message and or theme from the day. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much every single uh-huh. Sunday, um, you know, occasionally with communion thrown in there once a month. Um, and that's what it kind of looks like. And all of our prayers kind of follow a similar structure. And if yep. you were probably to line up um, our like extemporaneous, which I, by that I mean prayers that we're just kind of Spontaneous. spontaneously yeah. praying. Mm-hmm. We don't have them necessarily planned a lot beforehand. Mm-hmm. I bet you you would, if you could run those through like an AI thing, I bet you they could come up with a list of maybe 15 themes that we just like repeat over and over and over again. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and that's the same thing that will probably happen in ninety percent of non-denominational churches. Yeah, well, yeah, it it could be you could you you might say that like liturgy is another word for pattern. Yep, it's a pattern. It's, it's the pattern of worship. Yeah, and it's the way that like it's pretty predictable, mm-hmm. honestly. Um, but you'll, what we have found and what we are finding is that we, we have mixed in here some, what could be considered more traditional Mm -hmm. aspects of liturgy that are, they kind of skip outside of the pattern. Yes. Um, and it's. It, it's caused some people some distress. <laughs> yeah, we talked about liturgy <clears throat> and stuff and communion, I think, last year on the podcast. Mm-hmm. We took several episodes to kind of talk about some of this stuff before mm-hmm. um, because we were making the change. And since we've made the change, we, on a somewhat regular basis, will hear comments about 
the liturgy, either questions or comments, kind of like, what's going on? Why are we doing that? And yeah. yeah. Or people saying, I don't like it because yes. it's too... Catholic. Catholic. What do you think they mean by that? Well, I like I I grew up in like a, you know a non-denominational missional like let's get back to the Bible kind of church, mm-hmm. um, and you know the way it was described to me as a young kid. Um, I thought pretty much all the mainline denominations, this is a characterization that I don't believe is true, but this was the way religion outside of my church was talked about. I had this idea that if you were in a mainline denomination or if you were a Catholic, that like all that was was just people doing robotic motions, thinking that they were being saved by doing robotic motions by saying certain things or doing certain things, getting up and kneeling and all of that, and just doing it because they were told to. And that if they were doing that, that was the the dead works that were described in like Paul's writings and things like mm-hmm. that. And so I think that that's at least where some people are kind of coming from is they're like, well, is us is us not doing this, like doing this thing? This feels like potentially works or this feels like inauthentic and um robotic and forced Mm -hmm. and just generally kind of awkward if you've never been a part of it before or something like that i think that's where people are kind of coming at when they kind of say well isn't this really catholic yeah yeah i think the it being forced is what and it being robotic is really i think at the heart of what people why people kind of like um bristle yeah bristle against it and we do have a fair amount of uh former catholics Mm -hmm. at our church yeah um but i think that they like a lot of the things that i've heard is that it has the liturgy feels like it has less meaning when we're forced to say it yeah. or when it's like pre-planned. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's for me, I think a deeper, maybe it's a theological issue or maybe it's a, like a practicum issue or whatever, but what the difference between like spontaneity versus planning right? and how both of those are measured in authenticity. Mm-hmm. Like, um, like, I mean, we've heard, we'll, you, we'll hear things fairly regularly about how, like, if it's not spontaneous, it's not the Holy spirit. Yeah. Cause the Holy spirit is only spontaneous. Right. It's only extemporaneous. It's only off the cuff. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Holy spirit never plans. No. Never <laughs> like, that's just not what the Holy spirit does or is or whatever. Um, and, um, I think part of the question that I have about literally liturgy in general is, um, does spontaneity bring meaning or significance to it or is or is there meaning and significance in the thing itself and our refusal to engage in it is just a refusal to recognize the truth of either what's proclaimed in it or the actual act of worship in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think there's uh, some, so there's some bit of it. It's where where I feel like it's a, we feel like we have to bring meaning to the words Mm -hmm. by making it authentic. Like it's, it's us that makes it real rather than the truth that is explicit and implicit in the words Mm -hmm. that actually makes it real. And we are just participating with the truth that's being proclaimed. Mm-hmm. I think for me, that is where the rub is, yeah. is that people want to bring meaning to it. <clears throat> people want to bring meaning to the truth mm-hmm. where it's actually the opposite way. It's the opposite 
Like the truth brings meaning to us. Mm. And so when we participate in the proclamation of a truth that's already substantiated Mm -hmm. and formed, and we're doing that as a community, then it brings meaning to us, theologically speaking, as a community. Meaning like it's no... It is no less real. In fact, it's more real for me to recite the words of Scripture than um, around confession. Mm -hmm. It's more real for me to recite or read the words of Scripture on on the topic of confession Mm -hmm. than it is for me to muddle through my own understanding of confession, Mm -hmm. saying it, something about confession. Yeah. And somehow thinking that my spontaneity is more theologically significant yeah. for the moment of worship than the recorded words of Christ. Right. Well, that was that was the that was the impetus. That experience right there was the thing that initiated this whole movement to include a structured communion liturgy. Right. Like you, we were like because we weren't doing this. We were we were still mm-hmm. doing communion. We just weren't doing a communion liturgy. Mm-hmm. And like my experience was is like all right, I finished my sermon and now I need to say something about communion that mm-hmm. connects to the sermon mm-hmm. somehow, which was always a unique experience because sometimes the sermon did not always lend itself to directly tie into communion. Right. Um and then I'm up there and I'm talking about communion and I have like I don't know, 10 different books running through my head about communion and its theology and its meaning and its mm-hmm. significance and what does it mean, what does it not mean, <clears throat> and what, you know, how do I hold my own personal convictions about uh, communion and know that there's other people out there who maybe have different convictions about like what's happening at the table and, and, and navigating all of that. And I'm trying to say all of that off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, or at best, I've kind of written down a couple notes ahead of time to try and like navigate that, like mm-hmm. f- when I was writing my sermon. Um, but always felt like, did I do that right? Did mm-hmm. I say something wrong? Did I say right. something right? Uh, if one of my college professors was to like, you know, it was really about like all communion, would he come up and say, Luke, really? <laughs> right. mm-hmm. Was that kind of. You know, were you similarly? Was that kind of what you were experiencing, or what was it from your side of the experience that you were feeling like moving from that extemporaneous space to to the liturgy? I just felt like it. Yeah, in a way, I I just felt like yeah, it was our extemporaneous words about communion ended up being. Um, it could be like not confused as being our own, like our own understanding of it. But um, like, like I already said, I just, I didn't feel, I don't feel like what the, what the experience of community needs or needed was my own interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. It like, like it felt for me, like a moment to just shut up and be silent. Mm. Like Cameron, you don't need to drone on and endlessly about, you know, how you see community and how it fits into your sermon and how it's, this is a reflection of your church. And Mm -hmm. like Christians have been practicing communion literally since the time of Christ. And there, um, there's nothing special about the way that conduit was doing communion before. Mm -mm. And, and I felt like there was value and depth in a connectedness to the Christian tradition that allowed us to step outside of our own, like our own effort at bringing meaning to it by describing it in our own words. Mm -hmm. Um, people might walk away from the communion table thinking, wow, my pastor did such a great job explaining that. And what I want them to walk away from the communion table with 
was a deep sense of experience with Jesus Mm -hmm. that was initiated by an authentic act of confession of their sins, Mm -hmm. proclamation of the gospel over them, reception of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, a connection with the rest of the community that was doing it, Mm -hmm. and a... um, and an extended time in the presence of God yeah. rather than like a, wow, isn't our pastor so good at explaining communion? Yeah. Um, and, and um, I'm, I have been quite amazed at the way that people will just completely throw the baby out with the bathwater mm-hmm. and just say, I'm not like, like I won't even come to church on the first Sunday mm-hmm. because I hate the communion liturgy so much. Mm-hmm. And um, that for me is like, that's an issue of their heart mm-hmm. and it's a hardness of heart. Um, but it's also just shows me that they've never, they never actually listened to or participated in what it was that we were doing mm-hmm. because Um, like it is, it is the retelling of the gospel story. What we try to do in every kid's Sunday school class, what Mm -hmm. we do from the, try to do from the pulpit, what we do in all of our Bible studies, it's a retelling of the gospel story. Right. It is a, it is a reminder and a proclamation that through confession and reception of faith in Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that we, we practice, or not, not not that we practice, but we we walk out the gospel drama mm-hmm. in the participation of bread and cup. We we enter into the drama of the gospel um, uh, as a as disciples of Jesus, just like he did with the twelve disciples that night. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that. When, if someone were to pick this up and read it with honest eyes, Mm -hmm. I don't know what you could possibly say that you'd be upset about. Be upset about, right? Because it is, um, it is like if I I was thinking about it yesterday as we were, um, uh, in worship, like right before we went into the community, if I had to, if I had to go through this mm-hmm. and attach a scripture reference to everything that there is, like that is scriptural in here, mm-hmm. there wouldn't be enough room on the margins. Oh no! For me to draw arrows with scripture references, it's it is paraphrastically mm-hmm. the entire scripture. Yes, from creation to final redemption. Yep. Like, and so, well, I just think if we're going to do something, we should just read, like, we should just recite the scripture. Okay, done. Mm -hmm. Done. Yeah, there's plenty of quotes from scripture in there. Yeah. And even when it's not, it's a condensing of scripture. Or it's a paraphrase paraphrase. in a better way than I would. Yeah. Say, well, well, why don't you just do it spontaneously? Like, why would I do something spontaneously that is like all over the pages of scripture? Mm Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't I, I get yeah. no I don't get it. No. Well it would it would take us like oh, I don't know, two hours at least to read all the scriptures right that the communion liturgy contains. Yeah. I think there is a portion of it, a large portion of it, that at the end of the day mm-hmm. people just don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> what? <That's... laughs> no, Cameron. <laughs> at the end of the day, there is just still, yeah. Even, even those who express faith in Jesus, mm-hmm. who are like, you can't tell me what to do. Right. I'm my own boss. Mm-hmm. I'm my own lord. I chart my own course. Mm-hmm. I practice my faith the way I want to. And, um, there's a little bit of that in all of us. Yeah, for sure. Um, but it uh, becomes. Um, it becomes, um, as a pastor, at least that's, those are the types of like heart postures that worry me for people. Mm-hmm. Um, because where there is 
no submission to something that's easy, mm-hmm. there definitely won't be submission to things that become difficult. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, um, yeah, when, when, when there is, when there is difficulty in submitting our heart, submitting not even our heart, submitting our will mm-hmm. to something so obviously like rooted in truth and scripture, then when things become really, when the stakes are extraordinarily high uh, and the pressure is really on, mm-hmm. um, then there's not a high likelihood of submission of will. Mm-hmm. And when we live lives that are consistently um, at odds with or in struggle with who is Lord of my life, is it me or is it actually Jesus? Mm -hmm. Um, Then we end up just kind of aimlessly, we're a ship without a rudder. Yeah. Yep. And and we, we drift in. We drift in damaging directions. So yep. that, from a pastoral perspective, that's my fear for people. I'm not saying that you have to like this sure. liturgy specifically, mm-hmm. but it feels to me like a little bit of a microcosm of an issue of lordship for mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking that I, I think I, I was just I was saying it tongue in cheek, but I think I actually am going to take this and like hyperlink it. Yep, hyperlink every single scripture reference yep. and offer it to people who are like, why are we doing this Catholic thing? Yeah. Actually we're doing this scriptural thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the thing too is that the communion liturgy is, I was thinking this at the beginning when you were talking and it is, it's anti-consumeristic because a lot of the way that which we are, modern liturgy the way we do church is a lot if somebody up on stage does a thing and we maybe say amen or go mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and communion liturgy or this communion liturgy is something that we do together as a community mm-hmm. like it i can't do the communion liturgy by myself right mm-hmm. i just can't because it's meant to be done as a church and two or more are gathered, mm-hmm. right? And so when we are the church, we can do this together. And it's something that not you or I get up and and, and do and we make happen. It's a, like... We're not individuals. Right. We're a body. Yeah. We, we are a body. Mm-hmm. And we have a head that is Jesus Christ. Like... We like the rugged individualism of Western of the Western world mm-hmm. is antithetical to the practice of or the the witness of Scripture, which describes the church as one, yeah, united, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God, one Father, uh, over us all, um, complete unity, mm-hmm. um, and but. Um, so like even even like corporate confession, like why would we be why are we corporately confessing everything? Jesus is my personal savior. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Yes, but he's also he has also come like to redeem not just you personally, your individual cute little soul. Right. But like all all of creation is bound up in the curse of sin including us as a community of people. Mm-hmm. Right? And so as a community, we have sinned. Yeah. As a people, we have sinned. They'll look no further than the Israelites. Mm-hmm. Right? As a people, they saw, they sinned. Right. Right. Um, and as a people, sacrifice needed to be made for their atonement. Yeah. So there was one sacrifice made for the atonement of the people, mm-hmm. not the individual Jew. Yeah. Right. Um, and so... There, um, yeah, the the communal aspect to our faith and to the practice of our faith is not cannot be overlooked. Yep. Yeah, I. It's we are the the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Do you think 
what would you say to I know what I would say, but what 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 would you say to the person who's like what would you say to the question of do you have to feel or have your heart be authentically aligned with the truth before you say it or confess it? No. No. Why not, Cameron? Why why shouldn't I why should I say the communion liturgy? Why should I say the communion liturgy, even if it doesn't feel like it's coming out of an authentic place in my heart where I feel it already? Uh, Because we are not a people that operate on feelings. We operate on truth. Like, and the truth for us is the authority of God's word. Mm -hmm. So if this was like a, you know, like a, completely non-scriptural communion liturgy that was not grounded in like the words and truths mm-hmm. of scripture, then I would say, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, if you're not ready to say that or believe that, don't. Sure. Right. But we, um, when we, when we enter, belief is not a, like, belief is not like a linear process. Mm-hmm. Like you either one day you don't believe and the next day you do believe. Mm-hmm. Um, it is often uh it is often the process of the building of faith, and so the, then the question would be like, well, well, at what, what, at what point of the intensity of your belief would you be ready to confess with your mouth? Also, I would say that like the act of confession um, actually helps to build belief mm-hmm. and actually helps to build faith. Right. Um, so I think in generally that's what I would say. Would you say something different or along those same lines? Or yeah, I think I'd say something around the same lines. I would say that like maybe we've overemphasized this like um, there is a there is a part of ourselves that can choose to like um you know, that can choose faith and can choose confession of truth, even if we're in a moment of not particularly feeling it or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a um, place of like, like, okay, like, why do I, why should I pray? Why should I read my Bible? Should I, should I do it because that's what I want to do? Or should I do that because that's the thing that I need to do? or ought to do. Mm -hmm. And it's great if you wake up some mornings and you're like, oh, I want to do my morning devotional, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, This is, like, we'll talk about morning devotional since that's like a a discipline that pretty much any evangelical, non-denominational Christian is going to be familiar with. But if you only do your devotionals on days you want to, where you're like, wow, it's coming out of an authentic place, I'm going to do it, Mm -hmm. how often are you going to do your devotional yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, well, what if you get up and you do it because you know it's the thing you need? You need Jesus today. Mm-hmm. Let's sit down and spend some time with him before I go throughout my day. And you will have days where you just kind of go through it and you're like, I didn't really meet with Jesus. Don't feel like I met with Jesus, but I showed up and I'm going to trust that Jesus was there and in it and is going to bless my faithfulness. And then some days it's going to be like, whoa, that was like the thing. Like, I just felt like I had a coffee with Jesus or something mm-hmm. like that. And, but you, you, you operate in both sides of the spectrum. If you only do it when you feel like it, mm-hmm. you're not going to experience much benefit mm-hmm. from it. You right. do it because of like this kernel of faith or this commitment or this belief and saying like, I, I, I want to want it. Yeah. I want to believe it. I want to believe it. Mm-hmm. And so, like, showing up and saying the communion liturgy or any liturgy is a, like, is a showing up and this is truth that I want to form me, mm-hmm. and I want it to, like, it, it kind of becomes this whole, like, you know, we enter into this chicken or the egg thing of, like, does our confession and does our belief... uh have to come from does it form us or do we form it right we're not giving it meaning by our belief yeah it's giving us meaning as it develops belief in us yeah yeah Yeah. i don't know it's maybe it's just the 
American individualism, we just all feel like we found the Bible and that it's up to us to like magically reinterpret what the Christian faith is. Or make it our own. Make it our own somewhere, somehow magically. Um, we're afraid to be connected to all of the Christians that came beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, I, when I when I talk with people who really struggle with Catholics and Catholicism and stuff, and there's, I'm not Catholic. We did a video where we responded to some... Catholic critic. A Catholic critic, mm-hmm. someone who was... Uh, a Catholic who was criticizing Protestantism. Um, and it was amazing how many things we agreed on and how many things that, like, I don't know. There, there's a reason we're not Catholic. I'm not saying go be Catholic, be Protestant, right? I chose chose to be Protestant for a reason. Um, but I think some people, the way that they kind of talk about Catholicism and other churches and other, like, faith expressions— you would seem to they would seem to kind of default think i don't know that they think through this implication that there weren't any christians until the reformation mm-hmm. like there was the early church which was like a magic little time of like a couple hundred years and then around like the first certainly by the time the first pope the church disappeared yeah. for a century or two um Even longer than that the church disappeared or, until yeah. martin luther decided that he was going to yeah. start a church again start a church again and and then you've got Lutheranism and uh, Calvin and all of that. And like I'm like, well, were there no faithful church churches, no faithful Christians? Yeah, they were just called Catholics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing, the other thing that I have to, like, I sometimes challenge people who like, because like more and more, like there was, you know, the rise of non-denominationalism is still relatively new. Mm-hmm. Um, so everyone was coming out of denominationalism and now you've got people who are growing up only in denominationalism mm-hmm. and they don't maybe understand, but they're like, well, like all those crazy things like baptizing babies, that's like a big one or mm-hmm. liturgy and all this other weird stuff. Like that's, that's not Christianity. That's mm-hmm. not biblical. And I'm like, well, do you think that? non-denominationalism is suddenly the ones who've only gotten it right right significantly enough so to be counted the church in the last 50 years yeah yeah like right like you 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 realize because like a lot of people like to be like well like calvin and luther and like rah rah the reformers right i'm like well you probably wouldn't like Calvin's church very much, to be honest with you. No. <laughs> Go read. Oh, no, that wasn't Cal- Was it Calvin that wrote, that wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? No, that was um, Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. Right. You wouldn't like Jonathan Edwards. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't like Luther. Like, Luther didn't want to separate from Catholicism. He wanted to reform it. Reform it. That's why it was called the Reformation. Yep. Um, and... Like the amount of things that Luther and Calvin, these other reformers that we like trumpet, Mm -hmm. shared in common with the Catholic Church would probably make you go, oh. And so Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know. I'm not saying that you, you know, because there's things you don't, I'm not saying that you have to believe those things, but I'm, I'm saying that I think sometimes the position we pigeonhole ourselves in pits us against the majority of Christians who have ever existed. Yep. Yep. Yeah, people people think, they look at me like I have two heads when I say that I, I enjoy going to Mass when I have opportunity. I'm not Catholic. No. And, um, and, you know, according to them, I can't take the Eucharist. Right. I can't participate in communion while I'm there. Um, but I do enjoy worshiping. Mm-hmm. There, because I understand that what's practiced there, I don't go there like trying to bring my sense of application or meaning to it. Right, I go there because there's a formative process that happens in the proclamation of the word and in the praying and in the uh, scripture reading mm-hmm. and in an opportunity to join with other Christians in the practice of faith. Yep. No. What do you mean you like going to a Catholic church? Do they make you pray to Mary? Uh, no, they don't actually. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is not like a anti or pro-Catholic conversation. It's no, just like a, it's not. What is liturgy? 
why have we chosen to do it right what is the like what is the kind of the content of our liturgy um and uh and yeah so the so the issues not issues some of the interactions that we've had around it here at conduit so yeah so if you have questions about the liturgy and why we do it or mm-hmm. liturgy in general or different types of liturgy we'd love to hear from you so we could yeah. talk about it so yep. it would be great yeah was there anything else you wanted to i don't think so hit on when it comes so. to that so no nope. um no i don't we appreciate you all listening yeah or watching or doing both whatever it is that you're doing if you would like it and share it subscribe to it we'd appreciate it um as always if you have any questions or topics that you would like to hear us talk about our text line is 716-201-0507 and we will catch you on the next one